Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 18th, 2018, and my guest is journalist and author Moises Velasquez Manoff. He first appeared on Econ Talk in March of 2014, discussing his provocative book, An Epidemic of Absence, his look at the idea that avoiding germs and parasites of, in modern times may explain the rise of various autoimmune disorders, asthma, various allergies. Today, we're going to talk about a recent article he wrote in the New York Times, Can Dirt Save the Earth? And if we have time, we'll circle back to the um, story of germs and parasites. Moises, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. Great to be back. Now, your story in The Times starts with a really bizarre and, uh, for me as an economist, fascinating story, even though on the surface it doesn't have that much to do with economics. But what it has to do with is uh, complexity and emergent order, which, of course, I'm always interested in, as listeners know. Tell the story of John Wick and Peggy Rathman, their uh, cows on their porch of their yeah. house, and what, what they discovered as they tried to uh, live a, a – a wilder lifestyle on their ranch in Marin County. Right. So, yeah, so in the late 90s, so so uh, Peggy Rathman is a children's book author, and you and probably any parents out there, it seems like everyone owns a copy of Goodnight Gorilla, including us, which is this uh, classic uh, children's book. She she wrote that book and, and no, numerous others. So she lives in San Francisco, lived in San Francisco in the late 90s, um, and they needed more space because her apartment was getting full of her illustrations. Um, and her husband, John Wicks, is he was then a construction foreman. So they started looking for places up north of San Francisco in Marin County and found this ranch of uh, over about over 500 acres, which they ended up buying. And they bought it because they wanted – basically it had this huge barn that they wanted to turn into an illustration studio. And it gave them a lot of space. Ultimately, that never had panned out because the barn was – was oriented wrong for the light or something. It never really worked out. But what did end up happening um, was that so that they were just enchanted with life up there, this bucolic life, lots of animals and gophers. There was even mountain lions wandering around, as there are out here in, in the West. Um, and uh, they decided to turn their land back to what they thought would be wilderness. So it had all that country is sort of uh, dairy country or cow country. It's been that way for like 100 years. Not exactly, and, uh, not exactly wilderness, by the way. It, it, one of the stranger things is when you go north of San Francisco, uh, you do see on, on Route 1, you, you do see cows grazing. Is it 1 or 101? 101, I think. You that's can, right. I mean, you see yeah. cows grazing by the side of the road. Kind of wild, but there are cows. Not so wild. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's a, it's a very agricultural landscape and specifically uh, dairy oriented for I, for some reason the climate, I guess, produces. You get the marine zone wetness coming off the ocean. So it, it even though it doesn't rain, like for, except for three or four months of the year, you still get uh, good g- grass growth. Uh, there, I think that's one reason. Um, in any case, so they 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 had some rancher had uh, had rights to their land, or they had they had, the previous owner had sold rights, grazing rights. So they revoked those rights. They kicked the cows off the land um, in in pursuit of going back to wilderness. And what happened was. Uh, the landscape started changing right away, turning into something that they did not like, which was a lot of invasive weeds started moving in and brush started moving in. Um, I mean, if you know about ecological uh, ecological colonization theory, it doesn't it doesn't actually it's not that surprising. So what happens is like grasses are the first colonizers of a disturbed landscape. Then brush moves in. Then maybe some scrub, depending on what the climate allows for, some scrub trees. And there would probably be oak scrub forest or something naturally. Um, and so really what they were seeing was this sort of recolonization without the grazing pressure of these different plants, which which um, they didn't appreciate because, the, you know, you walk out to like this landscape of rolling hills, verdant pasture, and all of a sudden it's becoming clogged with with all these sort of opportunistic weeds, right? Um, and and they didn't l- l- really like it that much. So they th- they first of all, John Wick went out and tried to actually literally kill some of the weeds back. There's one called a woolly distaff thistle, which is. <laughs> 
Um, it's an invasive. It's like it. It looks like a, a, a marigold on steroids. We have it in my backyard too. It's like it's prickly and it has these yellow flowers. But it's like it just. It's really powerful plant. It just moves in. It shoots in, and it's hard to like actually pull in your hands because it has these kind of spines on it. Um, so he was using herbicides and all sorts of stuff, trying to pull it out, and mow it. Of course, none of that works uh, because you're dealing with sort of this force of nature that's that's not. Um, it's not sensitive to that kind of intervention. So then they meet this this rangeland ecologist, Jeff Creek, who says, well, what you should do is instead of focusing on what you don't want to be there and trying to, ki- trying to beat it back, you should focus on what you do want to be there. And, uh, and so he looked at the hillsides and he said, you know, I bet, this is actually not in the article, but he said, I bet that there are seeds in this dirt still from the old uh, perennial grasses that that used to exist in California pre-European contact. So like in California in general, a lot of there there've been grasses introduced with European um, with your with basically with cows with the with the Spanish first and then with the United States. Um, so annuals grow and then die in one year. And perennials are those more big, bushy grasses that, that live year after year. And they have these really deep root structures. Um, so he said, I bet there are perennial seeds in there still if you, just, if you just graze the landscape in the right way. So yeah, so he said, if you bring back cows, it could actually help with this problem that, that seems to have emerged after you kick cows off. Like, so just to give some background, again, um, cows are generally, from the conservationist standpoint, are blamed for denuding landscapes, for um, desertifying them, and for good reason. I mean, that has happened around the globe everywhere um, throughout human history where overgrazing has basically turned semi-arid landscapes into deserts, uh, you know, all around the Mediterranean Rim. I mean, basically almost anywhere throughout the American West, anywhere that wasn't moist. I mean, cows can be a horrible a horrible sort of environmental destructive force. That's, you know, we had the same issue in Yellowstone, uh, which I've written a little about, and I think it's such a fascinating related story where the they get rid of the wolves yeah, because people are scared of wolves, I guess. Ranchers don't like them near the park. The elk population grows tremendously, and as a result, the elks denude and eat down to the ground basically anything, all kinds of stuff, especially around – uh, riparian systems around creeks and streams, and that ends up killing the beavers because they have no uh, stuff to make dams with anymore. That's right. And yeah. so you get this crazy thing that wolves are connected to beavers. If anything, you think wolves would eat beavers, and so more wolf, fewer wolves, more beavers. But it works the opposite way. And you know, cows don't have any predators, so if you do keep them in one space, they will kind of eat everything. Yeah, right. And so, well, they have what, predators. What, they have us, but yeah. But I mean. They, people, if there are people who want to keep a herd going, they're going to kind of eat a lot. Right. And so Jeff Creek is basically making the point that if you graze cows like wild herbivores that are pursued by predators, uh, so the, the term is mob grazing. That's one term. And the idea is just to keep them moving across the landscape. Don't leave them in one place too long. Keep a tightly packed herd the way you can imagine a herd of buffaloes uh, pursued by those buffalo wolves that we used to hear yeah. about back back in those gigantic wolves that used to hunt buffalo in the plains. 15, 20 um, feet long, yeah. <laughs> what, the wolves? Yeah, no, I'm, not, kidding. No, I'm not talking kidding. about the dire wolves. <laughs> kidding. No, just like, like it's funny, actually, I was reading, this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but I was reading um, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Little House on the Prairie, to my daughter a few months ago. And they and they saw some of those, you know, when when the those settlers were moving out onto the plains, they still saw some of those huge wolves that were just there were remnants of an older population. They were just getting killed off. Uh, that used to hunt buffalo on the plains in the Dakota. <laughs> yes. um, any case, so so they so he brings the the cows back and then manages them in this new way. Instead of just letting them free roam, basically, um, you he he cut up his land into, if I recall correctly, like sixty seven different separate lots that he moved them between, um, so that each lot would get intensely grazed for a very short period of time. And sure enough, the landscape responds, their pasture returns. And actually, what's interesting is he tells me, John Wick tells me that weeds actually taste very good to, to, to cows. So the weeds are like the first things to go. Um, I mean, it's in a way it makes sense. Like any, any plant that has prickles and stuff all over it is a plant that probably tastes pretty good. That's why it has prickles all over it, you know, to defend itself. Um, like so the that. landscape 
is reverting back to this to what they what they consider to be what they really wanted when they thought of wilderness, which is not at all wilderness. No. It's more of uh, right. It's more of a grazed ecosystem. Yeah, um, I mean, it it's feels like wilderness to us because we don't know what the real thing was. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, honestly, if you go back to pre like to the Native American times, that's what these ecosystems were. They had large grazers like elk. Um, and they had lots of predators, like like big yeah. cats and bears. There was there was grizzlies out here in yeah. California and humans. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and humans, of course. And in pre Native American, there were even larger and larger grazers. You know, there was these mastodons and and uh, the mammoths. Um, actually, I'm not sure which ones were out here, but the, you know, huge grazers were out here shaping the landscape with huge predators following them. So this is what exists uh, b- when people don't interfere. Long story uh, short, I'll, I'll fast forward here. So they become curious about – Jeff Creek is very uh, interested in climate change. He's worried about it. He thinks uh, – he's interested in, in the idea that you can get carbon into the soil uh, from the atmosphere. And basically how that would work was be plants, of course, capture carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. And they use the carbon to build their own tissues um, as well as to they, – they excrete – sugars into the soil to feed microorganisms that then in exchange for those sugars give them other nutrients that the, that the plants might not be able to get on their own. So he 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 urges John Wick to get in touch with a soil scientist at the uh, at UC Berkeley, Wendy Silver, and said and they basically come to an agreement where she's going to study their land and see if they're getting any carbon into their into the soil. Doing and, what they're doing. And the argument would what would be the logic because they've got a richer grassland now that yeah. they'd be absorbing more carbon from the air nearby, and that carbon would show up either in the soil or in the plants themselves. That's right. I mean, and there is – there's a whole sort of – well, there's an argument out there that I did not go into in this in this article. Uh, but I guess its major proponent is a, a, a land ra- a manager named Alan Savory, and he gave this TED Talk. He's very influential in ranching circles, but very controversial in scientific circles, mostly because the evidence of what he says is possible doesn't exist yet. But he, he makes his argument. No, we'll that find we, it. <laughs> Just give us time. Yeah, we'll, well, that, we'll make it up if we of, have to. That's where we are, kind of. I mean, yeah. like, okay. so, so he, he basically argues that you, if you just graze right in this way, this mob grazing way, what he, which he calls holistic management, um, that you can actually, uh, you know, we could deal with climate change. You could greed the world's deserts and, you know, sort of, uh, it's the opposite of what most conservationists think about cows, which is that we should get rid of cows because they not only denude the world's uh, semi-arid regions, they also belch methane, which is a greenhouse gas that's about 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. But the, um, argument, the argument here is that the cows are going to, allow healthier – even though they themselves might not be so great, they're going to f- clear a path for some really good things to grow in the soil and improve the soil so that there will be less carbon in the air. And then it's an empirical question of whether they're a net positive or negative, and then there's another empirical question of whether you can get those benefits without cows somehow. Yeah, so I mean I think fundamentally if you back up, the premise that uh, grasslands can capture – Huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere and put in the ground is absolutely true. Some of the richest soils that we have are were formerly grasslands, like the Great Plains, like you know the Midwest, like the Ukrainian steppe. These were all grasslands um, before we plowed them up to, to plant stuff. And that, like that's what is it, like seven feet of topsoil or something in in Iowa, like some amazing amount. That soil is just incredibly rich. Those same ecosystems also also hosted huge wild grazers, right? I mean, they, 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 they were just herds of millions of buffalo running up and down the Great Plains. Lewis and Clark, what they saw when they, when That's they right. uh, went there. So, and, and it, in, in, uh, in Eurasia, it was maybe horses. I mean, it's, since there was this sort of human footprint is a little bigger there. Um, but it was also, there were also huge grazers there as well. So it's fundamentally true. There's actually this paleobotanist at the University of, of uh, Washington, if I remember correctly, um, Gregory Ritalik, who argues that in, in deep time, the, the 
coevolution of large grazers and grasslands became so efficient at pulling carbon out of the atmosphere that it actually reduced the amount of, of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere such that it triggered the ice ages, which begin around two and a half million years ago. Before that, there were no sort of these, these periodic glaciations that, that we call the Pleistocene. They, they weren't happening, right? Earth was kind of in a different sort of phase where it was just a lot warmer all the time. Um, so he makes this argument that it was actually that, that it actually cooled the Earth and, and caused this, 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 these periodic glaciations. So I think that's fundamentally true when we think about um, grazing and grasslands. But whether or not cows, which are domesticated animals, can do replicate what happens in nature – um, is an o- still an open question, I think, right? And so this sure. is this is this is this idea that's out there that John Wick and Jeff Creek were interested to see if they were doing. And actually, I should point out that they discovered that it, it wasn't happening. There was not carbon getting into the ground from grazing. Um, so what ends up happening? Uh, I'll back up a little bit from that point. Uh, is that they they start their so Wendy Silver starts their studies with a series of just baseline measurements in Marin and Sonoma counties of of rangelands, just to get a sense of how much carbon is there to begin with, right? In the soil, so they dig these these uh, three foot long soil cores out of the ground and examine them. Um, and what what she discovers is that dairies dairy farms have a lot of carbon in them and it's it's very recent carbon like it's got there recently it arrived to the, into the into the ground recently and and so they go around asking like what are you guys doing different on these dairy farms and what they do is they you know dairy farms they milk the cows they take them to a central shed uh and and they they have a lot of manure they have to deal with it's a huge problem actually in in dairy farming in the sense that you just have to manage a lot of manure and they and they use water to wash it away and so they end up with this kind of slurry this manure slurry and what they did in a lot of those places and a lot of those farms is they sprayed it back in the land as a fertilizer and a way, as a way to manage it so they were basically what she discovers is that there are things you can do to your land that increase the carbon content of the land right and that dairy farmers are already unwittingly doing this so they decide well maybe we could replicate this um, on, on John Wick, he's like, he says, maybe I, I'd like to be able to replicate this, but I don't want to use cow manure because cow manure produces lots and lots of methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, and lots of nitrous oxide, an even more powerful greenhouse gas. So the numbers are like methane is around 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide is around 300 times more powerful. Um, so they, So Jeff Creek, he had been... A, an organic farmer. So he was very familiar with compost. Uh, and compost is basically just, it's, it's food scraps or tree, shredded trees or any, any kind of organic material really that's been decomposed, partly decomposed by microbes. By, but these are uh, microbes that are not anaerobic. So like the, the key to composting is, of course, anyone who has a backyard compost pile knows that you have to constantly sort of turn the pile to keep it aerated, to keep oxygen in there. Otherwise, you start getting really nasty smells. Um, and from the scientific point of view, you start getting those powerful greenhouse gases. So they put a bunch of uh, compost, about half an inch over a few acres. And what they discover over the following years is that is compost um, seems to act like, on one hand, like a, like a kind of fertilizer, a long, slow-acting fertilizer on the landscape. So that it's, it supercharges the grass growth. This is rangeland. This is land that's being, you know, it's grass. It's land that's being grazed at the same time. So it makes about 50% more grass grow, which is great. It's great for anyone who has cows in their land, which John Wick does have. Um, and it causes, it, it allows more water to be um, absorbed or held in the soil because the more organic material you have in the soil, the organic material works like a sponge and holds the water. So there's more water stays in the soil. This is, again, this is grassland that gets water only in the winter, really. Um, and then the rest of the summer here in California on the coast, we don't really get any rain. So we get this marine layer of moisture that comes in, but that's it. Um, and then what's happening also is that it, carbon is going into the ground at an incredibly rapid rate. So in the untreated uh, control plots, they know, the carbon is getting lost from the ground. This is just nothing is happening on the land. The land's being grazed. Carbon is, getting, is, is seeping out of the ground. And no one's really sure why this is the case, but it's likely that it results from, from that transition I mentioned earlier 
of, of, of the kinds of grasses that grow there from the old perennial kind, which are, are, are you know, they, they grow year after year, the same plant, and they have really deep root structures. So that those deep root structures push carbon into the ground or deposit carbon in the ground. And the annuals, which don't have these deep root structures. So they, the landscape had gone from perennial uh, to annual, and that probably causes caused over time a loss of carbon. But on the treated plot, the opposite happened. Carbon was getting absorbed, and most of that carbon no, – so compost is very rich in carbon, obviously. Anything that's organic has a lot of carbon in it. It also has nitrogen and other stuff in it. Um, but the carbon that was going into the treated plots was – most of it was not um, from the compost. Most of it was from the air, meaning that she had – she be, uh, Wendy Silver had, had – basically caused the ecosystem there in that treated plot to become so um, – to accelerate at such degree, to accelerate photosynthesis, that there was just carbon being pumped into the ground. So I'm going to pause you here because it's, it's a little bit complicated. I just want to let – do a little reset here for, for listeners. First, I want to point out something you point out in the article, which is really an incredibly beautiful idea, that, of course, the carbon <coughs> that we use for energy purposes like – Oil is the result of this process from millions of years ago that that plants absorbed carbon, died, went into the ground, and eventually turned into petroleum, correct? That's right. I think oil actually comes from some – But I mean fundamentally, yes, you're right. But oil comes from a marine process. Coal comes from a wetland uh, uh, process. But yes, you, you're fundamentally correct. All that carbon came from photosynthesis and got deposited somewhere and then got buried at some point and then was fossilized that after it got buried and became this fuel that we, that we now we, power civilization with. Right, and we create civilization with it, and we pump a lot of it into the air as a result, and it seems to be getting a little bit warmer. We can debate about how much. I'm a lukewarmer, but I meaning I think there's some warming. I don't know whether it's catastrophic, but I'm worried about it a little bit, I think, because you should always worry about the, the downside risk uh, that could be catastrophic. I learned that from Nassim Taleb uh, in Common Sense. And and so that's just a beautiful thing that we could recreate that, use that same process to get the carbon that's in the atmosphere now back into the ground. It's kind of a cool thing. Uh, the economics of it, of course, and by that I mean not the financial part but the big picture economics is – this does strike me as um, – and my favorite Hayek quote, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. So part of this – your article is this really crazy idea that somehow we're going to re-engineer the soil to solve this other problem we've got over here. And we don't really understand the whole thing that, and really that well. There's, we get glimpses of what's going on. We run this one study. This Wendy Silver's done it. It looks encouraging, this incredible reduction of carbon, but we don't know if it's going to scale. We don't know what the other effects are. We don't know if by spreading compost in a really wide range across all kinds of different terrains, what could happen. But the bottom line is this encouraged people to start thinking about one way to fight global warming and climate change is to change farming rather than, say, cars, which is really interesting, which is why we're, we're talking. That's right, and it's often these these modifications in the agricultural world are a lot cheaper than you know photovoltaic uh, panels on on all houses or or all this more high tech stuff because you're just tweaking how you do what you're already doing uh, in some respect. And I should point out that um, this is often thought of in this you know in the circles of people who are the proponent circles uh, as as being beneficial to the farmers themselves. So yeah, and we're the not going to punish the, them for their right. for their bad use of cows and therefore put a big tax on cows or force them to change. We're going to find us a win-win is the ideal. Well, it's 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 more that um by getting carbon in the soil, you actually improve the efficiency of fertilizers. Uh, so like you need basically less fertilization of synthetic fertilizers, and the more carbon expensive. you have in the ground. <laughs> they're expensive. So that's right. You save money. Um, and, and there are a bunch of other things as well. Like, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting because 
a lot of this stuff is sort of was clearly known before the advent of the modern agricultural toolkit, you know, of, of synthetic uh, pesticides and, and, and uh, fertilizers. This is what farmers had to do before, you know, the 19th century when the, they spread when the a lot of manure. Yeah. <laughs> but they knew that you had to return all organic material to the land. Otherwise, your land would stop producing. Yeah. Right. And so like so there, there are these I mean, there were like revolutions in Europe, for example, where they sort of centralized the cow barn to all in terms of all the fields. So they would be in the middle of the whole operation so where, where they, so that they could get the manure back to the fields easily. Right. It's like the spoke and hub airline system. It's great. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And they were also getting human waste back to the to the fields. I mean, there is like there was there was a point where. There was competition for the nitrogen in human waste for uh, producing, making gunpowder with it rather than putting it back in the fields, right, yeah. uh, in Europe. I like your term. I think you mentioned it when you wrote uh, – was this article on other – humanure. I don't know how to yes. pronounce it. Hugh manure. I don't know. <laughs> but that's somehow – there are other words for it. We won't use them on the program, but that's a, that's a um, attractive name for it. Well, they, I mean, the ter- other term is night soil, there which was go. used up in the twentieth, early twentieth century, which is just whatever was in your chamber pot, which is another nice euphemism. Yeah, um, went back on the garden in the morning, right? And and that was this was part of how agriculture worked because because otherwise you, your your land would after repeated growing, your land would start to lose its fertility and nothing would grow there. The other part, the other aspect of this was that you would rotate what you did in your land crop, crop rotation, right? You would you would change what grew where because different plants both feed the soil in different ways and also take different things out of the, out of the soil, and you would also rotate in grazing with your farming. Um, so that you would let one, you would let one field that, let's say, grew corn last year, you would just let it go to pasture and graze on it for another year, um, and then plow it the following year. And that this is all; these are all techniques to maintain fertility, which I guess they're, they're sort of coming, they're they're coming back because after, you know, almost a century of doing everything synthetically, a lot of the the land is in the United States and in the world and developed world is tired. exhausted. Yeah, it's, it's tired. Exhausted. <laughs> well, one. You have a great, amazing statistic in here, which I would just never have imagined to be the case. I assume it's true. Uh, more than one third of Earth's ice free surface is devoted to agriculture. Part, yeah. I mean, part of it's hard to believe is the United States, which, of course, has, for better or for worse, probably the world's most productive agricultural system in, in certain crops, for sure. I don't know how widely that's the case, but we're, our, we've got some, some great, uh, we've got great. Machinery to to keep the price down, and we've got great uh, synthetic stuff to to keep yields high, and and we have great seeds, and we have we we're at the cutting edge of everything, uh, but most of the world's not. Uh, a lot of the other parts of the world's not, and they need a lot more land to grow food, and just right, it's just surprising yeah. that that well, number is. That statistic is also, it includes uh, rangeland, and actually about two thirds of what we do with land in the world is grazing it. Wow! It's, so most, so just like one third of that is actually used to grow crops, because most marginal land that is used for grazing, like stuff you, you know, the hills and stuff you can't plow up, um, that's just you just let cows roam on it, and then in, especially in poor countries, you're you're able to get another protein source from that grass, that, that land that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get anything from. Right. Cool. So where are we? So we, we this experiment gets done, and talk about where. This is, I, I just like that story for a lot of reasons. I like it because of the unintended consequences part of it. The fact that these people hated these cows and thought by getting rid of them they'd make their land better, when in fact their land got to their eye at least worse. The other thing I like, I just got to mention because I don't want to miss this chance, Moises, is that your uh, research interests and interests as a writer. Uh, strike me as um, united. I'm sure. I assume you've thought about this, but maybe not. So your first book, or no, not your first one. It was your first one. The Epidemic of Absence book is about the microbiome. It's about our gut. And this article and other stuff we're talking about is about the soil. And on the surface, they have nothing, nothing to do with each other, but they're united in, in a couple of ways. One way is that they're both about complex ecosystems, emergent orders. That are not easy to look at. So the soil's underneath the ground, and my That's gut true. is yeah. inside my body. 
And yeah. so they're, they're complicated systems that are hard to get at. And as a result, there's all kinds of things to be discovered there that may not be obvious and are connections you don't know, get to see and might not appreciate. So I don't know. There's a, there's a symmetry in your work there that I love. And then there's cows because cows are really yeah. – <laughs> cows are, are good for the soil and they may appear to be good for helping us fight autoimmune disorders by introducing parasites and other things into our microbiome that – We've lost as we've moved away from agricultural life. If we have time, we'll come back and talk about that in the gut. But I just those two. I just want to point those out. Yeah, well, you know, they're it's actually it's they're more closely linked these two th- big themes in my work, um, in the sense that that uh, the microbiome is of the soil is also what's responsible for the carbon sequestration. Um, so the plants, basically, what plants do is they capture carbon from the air and Produce, besides making their, their plant forms, their actual tissues, they create sugars with a huge amount of the carbon that they get from the air. And those sugars go right into the ground to feed the microbiome of the ground. Ah. So there, there's this whole microbiome in the ground. I mean, this whole ecosystem really in the ground that's being fed. The, 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 the plants are basically working as pumps, carbon pumps. So this is how it was described to me, I think, by Wendy Silver, if I remember. But the, the purpose of the plant in this bigger ecosystem is to just pump sugar into the ground or other kinds of, of carbon, long carbon chain molecules um, that are then consumed by this incredible array of life in the soil that then return, does, uh, returns other nutrients uh, in exchange for those sugars. Um, but that is the carbon pathway of how you get carbon from the air into the ground is basically by passing it through all these life forms and a huge chunk of those life forms are microbes in the soil. So basically healthy soil is basically about a healthy soil microbiota. It's it's all about the gut. It just, whether it's inside you or underneath the ground, it's all about the gut. That's right. I mean, you (laughs) could think of the, of the soil microbiome as a kind of analog to the gut microbiome in a way, you know, it sort of powers everything. Like you said, yet we can't, we don't, we don't pay much attention to it. We yes. haven't historically. Well, being, also, it's, 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 we, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say that the the advent of genome sequencing technology is letting us see both these microbiomes in a way that we could absolutely not see them in times past. That's another part that, of this story. Well, when I when I was uh, when I was a little boy, I did not grow up in in farmland. I grew up in suburban Massachusetts, mostly in Lexington, and we'd go out and we'd play in the dirt. And we loved worms, and I liked to fish, so we'd go try to we we dig up dirt and find worms in there. And if you'd ask me, since I didn't have a farming background, you know what's underneath the Earth's surface? It's well, it's dirt and worms, which of course is I'm getting there. But but the idea of the richness of soil, the chemical composition of soil, the difference between dirt, clay, and say loam, you know, a rich fertile yeah. soil is people for most of human history were obsessed with it. Absolutely. We're just not. Really uh, that involved with that. I'm going I'm to read one more thing from uh, read another thing from your article, by the way, and then we'll get back to the policy stuff. I, and I, I hope listeners are enjoying this because to me it's it's extremely interesting. And but we'll get to some policy implications in a second. It says you're talking about when they brought the the uh, cows back to the uh, Marin County uh, acreage that uh, Wick and uh, Rathman, the author uh, children's book author, their their ranch. It says. By summer send, the cows, which had arrived shaggy and wild-eyed after a winter spent near the sea, were fat with shiny coats. When Wick returned the herd to its owner that fall, this is the herd that he had grazed on his land to try to get it back into shape. Collectively, it had gained about 50,000 pounds. <laughs> Wick needed to take an extra trip with his trailer to cart the cows away. That's right. That's, that struck him as remarkable. The land seemed richer than before. The grass lusher, meadowlarks, and other animals were more abundant. Where did that additional truckload of pl- animal flesh come from? And, of course, the answer is they were eating carbs, which brings us back to other econ right. talk episodes <laughs> about carbs and weight gain. So I just thought I'd bring that in. I love that. So cool. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and of course, the, those carbs were coming from the sky. I mean, that's the whole – the carbon cycle we, we often forget – but the carbon cycle basically begins with photosynthesis, and then you eat the plants that have captured the carbon, and then plants eat the, those. An, I mean, uh, uh, other animals eat those animals on down the chain. Then, then they decompose. They go into the dirt, and other plants grow out of it. And you know, and then eventually, all that carbon is released back into the atmosphere. That that the carbon represented in that first plant that grew that was eaten by the cow. But that's that's the short term carbon cycle right there. So is this is this really cool? I mean, it's fascinating to me. It's interesting. It's a beautiful example of 
the seen and the unseen theme of love and economics, emergent order, things that are complicated and related to each other in not obvious ways, which I love. But is it important? Is it really a potential uh, mitigator of climate change in any way? And who's who's skeptical about it? Why are they skeptical? You know, obviously, if it if it was good farming practice across the board, it would just happen. Do we is it something that people are trying to encourage artificially through subsidies or various regulations? And what's its yeah. potential? What do you think? It's a great story. Is it is it of well, any meaning? So, well, the, the carbon farming with compost is just one method of carbon farming. And carbon farming is this idea that we can get carbon from the air into the soil or into just living trees or plants or, you know, woody material that's a, that's that's not the atmosphere, right? So, um, well, so there are other methods of doing this that don't involve compost, like, you know, you cover crops. Some of the older stuff that we, I alluded to earlier, the older agricultural methods that – because in the past, when we didn't have syn- synthetic fertilizers – and and farmers were, were naturally obsessed with soil health, even though they didn't maybe call it that. They sort of developed all this stuff. And so there's a movement now for independent of what John Wick and Peggy Rathman are doing, um, sort of encompassed under the moniker uh, regenerative agriculture, where they're trying to – to a lot of the agricultural land in the world is exhausted because it's just – you know, we basically plowed the hell out of it and put a, and and doused it with herbicides and pesticides and and um, fertilizers when it was losing fertility. So the idea is to sort of regenerate some of the soil. So I visit one other farmer who's doing this stuff as a way to just farm more efficiently. And um, to answer your question, because we have to think of this as a suite of practices, right? It's not just compost. There's a whole number of things you can do. And the idea is to get farmers who are <clears throat> who are cultivating crops to uh, to take up some of these practices. And these guys, there's a, there's a number of people around the states now who are doing this. Gabe Brown, I referenced, he's sort of a pioneer. Um, they say that they are producing crops with with fewer fertilizers, fewer pesticides. These are not organic heads. You know, there's no ideology here. What they're trying to do is is farm more efficiently so they can make more money, right? Um, and in being Nothing to be ashamed of there. No, no. Um, <laughs> these guys, you know, these are these are uh, not nothing. Not that there's anything wrong with California hippies, but these guys are not California hippies. <laughs> They're sort of mid of the middle country, just just regular farmers looking for different ways to do things. I mean, farming is a difficult business. The, the profit margins are so so slim, right? Um, and so anything you can do to to keep more of the money that you generate uh, is good. And what these guys do, it sounds like I've talked to a few of them, is that by focusing on soil health, they reduce their pesticide use, their fertilizer use, their herbicide use. Um, you know, they get basically nitrogen into the soil by using cover crops, cover crops like legumes. Legumes have these nitrogen fixing bacteria in their roots. So you get that in there naturally without having to purchase synthetic fertilizer. And I know people will say fertilizer is cheap, but I also, you know, again, the the profit margins are so slim. Anything you can do is going to help you out. Um, And so what what they do is they produce crops, they say, for about 20% less than conventionally farming people. And so you you wonder, well, why isn't everyone doing this, what they're doing, right? And And, I I guess one reason reason is these are smaller farmers than the largest farmers in America, I assume, is part of it. That's part of it, but that is not the answer that they give. Um, the answer they give is that uh, that people don't want to change the way they farmed for perhaps generations, and in a way admit that. that they that they no, but but and admit in a way that they were they made a big mistake. Yeah, sure, that's no fun. It's like reminds me of the doctors who uh, who thought that uh, women were dying in childbirth because the windows were open and that brought in bad air, right? right. And, and while um, What's his name? Uh, Semmelweis. Semmelweis. God bless yeah. him. Although it took too, way too long for people to agree to it. He said, maybe you should just wash your hands. He did a little quick experiment, showed it, and uh, they weren't convinced because it was one experiment. It was a small sample. For him, it was so obvious he didn't even need to make it larger. But for them, it was like, you're telling me that I've been murdering women because I went from the morgue with That's the woman right. dialed in childbirth right. to go deliver a baby. And you're telling me That's that for right. the last 30 years of my life, I'm a, I'm a killer. And yeah. you just couldn't face it. I think that's a huge part. There's a huge psychological part of that. Yeah, you've been an idiot in this case, and yeah. maybe you've damaged the environment too. It's no fun. And, and by the way, Semmelweis ended up dying in an insane asylum. 
Yeah, I forgot about that. Well, he wasn't. I, I didn't, he wasn't. He was on. Go wasn't, ahead. He wasn't fully appreciated. He, he he resented the fact that in his lifetime, his ideas were seen as quackery. Act, absolutely. I mean, that's um, part of why he might have ended up in insane asylum. Yeah, I don't know if that literally drove drove him crazy, and I I, I wonder. I, but no, I think probably syphilis drove him crazy. But but I mean, that was the big. It, you know, this is a huge tangent, but the idea being that you can you can be right and uh, never be recognized for it, and in fact be sort of marginalized easily in your lifetime. Well, Milton um, Friedman stayed happy and cheery even when he was in the total intellectual <laughs> desert and, and laughed at because he thought that inflation was caused by printing money. So he's always my exemplar of the other part. There you go. But, but there you plenty go. of people do uh, at least become bitter and. Uh, deeply troubled by the fact that they the world doesn't recognize them for their genius. And he was, I don't know who's a genius or just lucky, but he was right. We know that now as much as we know anything. And it must've been no fun to think that people were dying because people didn't accept his ideas. Horrible. Yeah. And in this case, in, in the farmer's case, so, I mean, they don't care if other people, other farmers accept it because they're, they're, they're making a profit, right? Yeah, they're, they're doing okay. better than they did before. And yeah. they also, the truth be told is that, so the guy I profiled in Kansas, Darren Williams, they're also selling to these niche markets where they can get a slightly more money for their product because they can say, you know, this is cows raised in such and thus yeah. fashion. And, and, Correct. But not all of them are. There's, there's a guy, uh, Dave Brandt out in, um, I want to say, I think he's in Ohio, He's using cover crops, no animals. He's competing directly in the commodities market. And he, he's getting, he says, yeah, I produce stuff for about 20% cheaper than all my neighbors. Um, so it's not, it's not absolutely true that like, for example, if, if you think that if, if we could scale all this up, well, that little advantage of having that niche market would go away, right? Because there yep. would be no niche market anymore. But this guy's competing in, a, in the huge market already and he's doing fine. So I don't know. So there, I mean, so I guess just to bring in a little more economics, I, I think you alluded to this in a phrase maybe or a sentence in your piece. But if everyone did it and it brought down uh, the cost of – of um, production enough that it lowered price through competition, people would eat more of this, some of this stuff, and that might offset some of the gains because there'd be more land then devoted to some of these products. And so, you know, it's, yeah. the world's a complicated place. It is complicated. <laughs> um, but I, I think that what is indisputable, or or at least somewhat indisputable, uh, is that <laughs> oxymoron of all time. Then. <laughs> right, right. Says, I love that. Word. <laughs> um, like, is there a softer a- adjective for indisputable? It's like life? somewhat <laughs> literal. It's, you know, is that um, figurative or is it literal? <laughs> yeah. Is that these guys, their land is more resilient when they farm it this way. So they're more, they're, they're, they're better able to withstand the inevitable shocks of farming, like, like not enough rain. Yeah. For example, if you have more carbon in the soil, your, your, your crops are more resilient because there's more water stored in the soil. Um, not having to use as much fertilizer because you have more carbon in the soil. So there's a way that it improves farming such that uh, you're, you know, there's just, there are constant sort of shocks from price to weather to what have you in farming that you are insulated a little bit from those shocks because your soil is healthier. And I think that that is something that everyone could get on board with in theory. The, uh, The flip side though is, this psychological aspect of tradition that we talked about. And I have to say the one practice that people have a hardest time, um, and I do too in some ways, uh, considering that it might have been a mistake, is plowing. So these guys are all doing no-till growing, which means they don't plow anymore because plowing causes carbon uh, carbon soil loss. And so it's like that's 10,000 years of agricultural history, yeah. right? And all of a sudden it's been a mistake? Yeah, I'm- uh, we call it working the land. You're telling me I'm not supposed to work the land anymore? It's Yeah, right. that's kind of weird. Well, the reason it is because um, we plow because – well, we plow because it sort of loosens up the soil, obviously. And you can use cover crops to also loosen up the soil. Like these guys all grow these huge daikon radishes <laughs> that, that are like feet long. If you look at photos of, of what David Brandt gr- grows, they're like two or feet long, these huge radishes. And they break up the soil. You know, these huge roots going into the ground break it up. Um, that's number one. Number two is you plow to, to limit weed growth. And what these guys use instead, uh, is, is first of all, they graze their land, they rotate grazing into their land. Um, and they use cover crops to basically, what they're doing is engineering an ecosystem where weeds can't get a foothold. 
So when you grow crops there that grow really high, you're squeezing out the weeds. You're not allowing the weeds to take, take root. It's just so uh, incredible. I, you know, it's a, it, there's something really beautiful about it, right? And, and I love the inevitable trial and error. Of, they're trying all kinds of different things. Like I'm sure the first guy did, <laughs> trying this didn't say, ah, daikon radish, of course. You know, somebody thought yeah, of that no, idea right. and tried it. And it seems to work, and it's a beautiful thing. Well, the, you know, Gabe Brown, who pioneered a lot of this, um, he's in North Dakota in the 90s because, incidentally, because he had he had his crop had been ruined by hail for three years in a row, and banks would no longer lend to him, oh. and so he had no way to get to pay for the things that he needed to do conventional farming. So he said, "Well, how am I going to farm?" Well, and then he thought, "Well, how did the guys used to farm before they had synthetic pesticides and all this other stuff?" And he ended up reading the journals of Thomas Jefferson, who who who, who you know ran a like a, a, a farm. A, yeah, not just a farm, a, a plantation. plantation. Yeah, no, for sure. Right. So so he read and he there he learned about crop rotation and and and, and using livestock and, you know, they had all this stuff figured out. And I think maybe even some of the cover crops, at least the rota- rotation, rotational part of the cover crops. Um, and then he also read about how Native Americans used to farm on the Great Plains. And, and there he learned about legumes and, and mixing crops together, legumes and um, and corn. You know, the legumes get the nitrogen into the ground. Um, and the, they and they provide like a way for the legume for the corn provides a way for the legumes to climb up and all, you know this sort of idea that you're really creating an ecosystem more than just growing a monocrop yeah. which you then ha- harvest. That's very cool. Um, so what's the potential for it though? Is it gonna is it gonna make a difference or is it just kind of a cool thing for a few farmers? Well, the farmers these guys are already running with it. We'll see how how I mean that's sort of happening on its own. How are we going to yoke all this to deal with climate change is, I think, a bigger question. I think we need some incentivizing to happen. Um, that is – and there are some really interesting ideas out there. Like, So basically what you want to do is to incentivize farmers to uh, treat their land a little bit differently so that they can get paid for carbon that's stored in the soil. So obviously that's not going to happen under the current the, – the, the Trump regime, right? Um, because they don't believe climate change is real, or at least that's what they say. Uh, but there is this uh, – let's just assume that we come to our senses regarding climate at some point. Um, and again, this is an idea that is not only good for climate. It is good for agricultural land, right? And we are – I spoke to uh, some people who said, you know, we're facing this much bigger problem. We basically don't have any more agricultural land, but we need to start – we need to feed a lot more people. So it needs to be more productive than it is. Now you could say, well, well, yeah, let's stop giving you know yeah. all our soy and our corn to to, yeah. to yeah. the animals. We got a lot of other problems. We got so many problems in the agricultural area. I mean, we've artificially privileged corn for starters. Uh, we pay people way too much money to do something that comes naturally, uh, which is growing food for people in the name of quote food security, which I think is just a cover for giving them money to your friends. So we, we, there are a lot of things we could do to fix agriculture, but whether agriculture could be part of a climate change solution if things get bad, I think is definitely important. It's worth considering. Yeah, but I, I think uh, you're not going to get farmers on board talking about climate. No, nope. right? Correct. It's not going to. They half of them don't believe it's even real. Well, actually, I mean that's I don't know that for a fact, but uh, for example, survey says. I, I, <laughs> I you know, just talking to. Uh, the farmers that I talked to who were doing this regenerative agriculture, they're like, climate change, whatever, you know. I just have to make sure to do that my job. land is resilient. Yeah, they're trying to do their job. They're, they're not so interested in public policy, and I get it. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. No, but it's more than that. It's that they don't believe it's real because they they red state people. Um, yeah. They, they get that media. Um, well, I'm um, a, a little bit of a skeptic too. I'm, I, I'm agnostic. I'm not a, I'm, I don't think it's false. I don't think it's fake. I think it's true that there's been some warming. We don't know how much – it's troublesome that it hasn't gone up a lot over the last 20 years. The temperature hasn't in the face of an enormous amount of extra carbon, which suggests we don't fully understand the mechanisms. But as I said, I think we should be cautious about it. But for whatever reason, it's not everybody agrees. And um, this gonna, it's, it, then you get the question of how you're going to want to make them do something that they don't naturally want to do. So that's going to be a lot harder. Well, for, yeah, I mean, first of all, you need <laughs> – 
I think the evidence is, is much stronger than you alluded to, that climate change is real and caused by humans. Um, but that's a whole different me- show and many other shows to yes, come. Yes, it is. Um, Correct. So, so how are you going to get farmers on board getting carbon into the ground? Um, well, you incentivize it through several possibilities. Uh, one is in California, we have this Healthy Soils Initiative where they are, they're helping fund some of this stuff because it often costs, you know, changing the way you're doing stuff costs uh, money up front. So they're taking money from the state's carbon mitigation funds. You know, so California is in this ambitious plan to reduce uh, our carbon emissions by – um, you know, the number actually, I think it's by 80 percent by 2050 or something like that, even though that needs to be fact checked. If you keep raising well, if you keep raising the income tax, you'll you'll do it easily because enough people want to leave, move to other states that you'll have fewer cars. Um, no, I'm just giving you a hard time. I says I'm sorry. But but I yeah, but I do think serious to, to be serious for a sec. I, th- I think the. The environmental movement, as well as legislators, need to think long and hard about how we spend our money to make the world a cleaner place and spending it wisely is always a good idea, no matter what you agree, no matter what dispute. And it's probably right now, many things have been subsidized that are either not good or actually don't help or actually counterproductive. Uh, So it would be, it would be good to spend some money that we already are allocating, maybe move it away from some things and toward other things. For, for uh, soil here, there's now some money available to people who want to try to get carbon in the ground. And so actually this has been promoted. The, the carbon farming idea has been promoted just as good agricultural practice by a, a, a department in the USDA already. Um, the, the Resources Conservation Service, um, which is – this is a, a, a sort of little known about um, – the national sorry it's NRCS National Resource Conservation Service that was founded in the wake of the Dust Bowl, which of course is this huge agricultural traumatic, traumatic example, yeah. experience that happened that we forget about. But basically, we plowed the hell out of land that shouldn't have been plowed, and then in, in conjunction with some dry years and a lot of wind, the topsoil of like the entire you know upper Great Plains ended up blowing away. And like if you read about what was happening at that time. Like the sky was red as far away as Washington, D.C. I mean, it was like a huge environmental catastrophe. Um, and it was driven by farming. So they, they, they founded this organization. It wasn't called this, the, the NRCS then, but it is now. And they focus on soil health. And in recent years, they've been trying to promote soil carbon. They have like 35 practices, 30 some practices that they consider that would that sort of build um, that that deal with this problem of if you plow your land, you're going to have a lot of the carbon blowing away or just eroding away uh, from water. Um, so they help also fund some of these things already. Um, very tiny amounts of money, not huge amounts of money. And the idea is they're funding you to take care of your of agricultural land, which in a way is a sort of, even though people own it, is also a, a resource in common for the country. Right? Well, it has external. How you use it can affect some people other than yourself. Obviously, when you own your own land, you have a, you have an incentive yeah. to not graze it to the ground, not take out all the nutrients. You may make mistakes out of ignorance or tradition or other reasons. But I mean, the other thought I had is that you mentioned niche markets. It'd be an interesting challenge for a uh, foundation to help uh, to fund farmers to try experiments on their own land who then in turn could market their products as being more environmentally friendly and and use some kind of labeling to encourage customers to pay a premium or maybe they wouldn't have to because it's as you say maybe it, it pays for itself yeah i think it pays for itself uh you know there's a, there's an initial period of years where it's not paying for itself sure but then over time as the soil gets healthier it starts paying for itself and you end up producing your crops um, for less, you know, less investment per bushel than your neighbors. Um, and so one really interesting idea that's out there, and I actually did not talk about this article, is to give people who are building soil carbon, give farmers who are building soil carbon um, a discount on crop insurance. Because in theory, that's cool. their farms are more resilient. Yep, should happen right? naturally. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, crop insurance is, as you know, as an economist, is a complicated. There's a you know, it's a complicated set of calculations that go to dictating what your premium is for the insurance. I don't know anything about it as an economist or as a, as a farmer. So, but you have, you understand like the idea of sure, it has to do with right, risk. Right. Yeah, that insurance I know a little bit about. Yeah, right. So, so in theory, your risk is right. lower if sure. you're building carbon. So you guys should pay lower premium. So there's one incentive right there. But there's also um, in in New York, they're thinking about. Uh, giving people, uh, farmers who build soil carbon tax breaks in some way or another. I don't, I don't know if they're calling them tax breaks. They have another term for it. Um, but anyways, there are multiple ways of, of doing this, of helping out farmers who are doing this, besides just handing them cash, I guess is the idea, right? Yeah. They're sort of – some of them are – legislators uh, around the country are very interested in this because they're interested in, in, in agriculture, and, and some of them are also inter- interested in climate. Um, well, here in passive- California – Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. We have this Healthy Soils Initiative. It's sort of like the example in the country of how this can be um, – how it can be incentivized. And they're getting some state funds to do some of this stuff. Farmers get some state funds to do some of this stuff. The other thing I was going to say is that you know farmers – we spend a lot of time eating as human beings. And as Americans, we eat a lot, mostly uh, uh, for many of us too much. And it's just uh, interesting how few people are involved in agriculture often point this out. It's 2 to 3% of the American people are in farming uh, because it's so productive. We don't need uh, That's to have right. a big population farming I- industry in terms of labor. And it, not only is it efficient enough that we only need a few, we make so much food that we can export a bunch of it. Uh, and so it's um, it's a very small group of people that we're talking about to change their habits if indeed this is a useful and productive thing to do. But I, I want to change – I want to – we're almost out of time and I want to sh- I want to talk for a bit about the human uh, microbiome, the, the, the small part of – the small part of us. Um, and I, I want to turn toward your, your book, An Epidemic of Absence. And that book had an incredibly provocative idea, which again was a – an amazing example for me of unintended consequences and complexity and emergent order. This idea that by cleaning up our environment and taking worms and parasites and germs, basically making our environment as sterile as possible. And I just talked to Janet Golden about the evolution of how we treat babies here on the program <laughs> in the 20th century and how what a great triumph that was. That we took so many things that killed people and got it out. We 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 learned that milk could spoil and we learned that germs carry disease and we learned that, that there are all kinds of things that people shouldn't eat and, and shouldn't be near each other at certain times. And, and that was a great triumph of, of civilization. It, it lowered infant mortality in, in extraordinary ways over the first half of the 20th century with lots of other things along the way, of course, not just our scientific knowledge. But, but you point out that maybe that came at, at, at a cost, certainly came at a cost. Uh, and maybe that cost was very large for certain people who, whose bodies, without the germs to fight, started fighting themselves. The the, the autoimmune system started to uh, eat us instead of the germs that were no longer there. They had to have something to do. And I, I found that deeply provocative. The book came out in 2012. We talked about it in 2014. And six years have passed since you wrote – then since you published the book. And more than that, it's passed <clears throat> since you did some of the research. And – it's an idea that's deeply appealing to the point where you yourself actually uh, put worms into yourself deliberately and other people continue to do that to fight certain autoimmune disorders. Do we have any more knowledge about whether this is just a possibility, true, maybe? What, what's, what's happened? Um, well, I think the hygiene hypothesis has only gained more uh, more steam and more evidence in its favor. But it, it, it's often like – it depends – who you ask, the, the meaning of what the hygiene hypothesis is, depend, you know, changes depending on who you're talking to. Um, but the idea that we need to tune our immune system early in life, that it needs to be educated early in life, I think we're just getting more and more evidence that this is true and educated by the right set of, of, of microbes. And they're not all microbes that we are fighting against. Many of them are just commensal microbes that – uh, because of the way we live now, um, and because of what of dietary changes, for example, that we are selecting for different types of microbes that are not necessarily the ones that educate our immune systems in a way that prevents some of these diseases from arising. Um, so, 
in terms of the microbiome front, that these are the just just the microbes and and um, you know the, the unicellular organisms. Uh, there's just there's so much research. It's hard to know what to look at. But I mean, like for example, I wrote an article about. Uh, a lot of this research started in Europe with the farming stuff. So it was farming kids were less allergic. Why? Because they're probably exposed to manure and cow sheds and they drink un, un, unpasteurized milk. Um, so then, it, then there is an interesting example, and I don't think this existed when we spoke last time, but of Amish kids in the U.S. now where uh, these Amish kids, they actually come from the same part of the world in Switzerland, German-speaking Switzerland, where a lot of this research first started. So it's an interesting comparison. Like they're, in theory, comparing genetically similar people. Uh, so what they, this m- most recent set of studies, of course, the Amish kids are like the least allergic of, all, of anyone they've ever seen in the developed world, um, of any subset of people. Uh, that just tells you that cell phones causes allergies. <laughs> well, Sorry. you know what's funny is I visited these one of these farms, uh, and I was talking to like an Amish elder, and he's like, "We can't deal with the cell phones. Like we've dealt with everything up until yeah, no, now. This but is, the kids, yeah. the kids are getting the cell phones, and we can't stop them. The ultimate parasite. Yeah, it gets a hold of the human host, and then they have their way. It's really a- <laughs> that. Yeah, so, I mean, so like that's a whole other story. And yeah. also, just to, just so I can preempt this idea, the Amish do get vaccinated. I don't know. There's this idea that they don't get vaccinated. They do. They get vaccinated. So it's not because they're not getting they're vaccinated. They're not against science. They're against technology of certain kinds. I think, right? They want to do certain things in traditional ways. Yeah, I mean, each sect differs. They what's that's another thing that's not appreciated by about the Amish is that they sort of decide in their communities what they're going to do. So each one is there are more strict ones and less strict ones. The one that I visited in Indiana, they got vaccinated. They just didn't like they didn't use um, they didn't want any external electrical lines coming to their houses, but they used lamps in their houses that had batteries. So there you go. There's the paradox. And one of them was a dairy farmer and he had just upgraded to like a modern dairy farming system because he's like, you know, I'm. He still plows his land with horses, but he, 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 to be able to sell his milk into the market, he has to pasteurize it and do all the stuff that, they, that modern dairy farming requires, you know, so you can sell it. Um, in any case, these guys are – the kids are super not allergic, and so they did this interesting study where they compared uh, the Hutterites, which are another group that stem from the same area of the world, they, and they're sort of religious, and they, they stick to themselves. They live in the upper Midwest and, and the plain states of Canada. Uh, the plain, not the states, the plains, uh, uh, provinces of Canada. And they are as allergic as anyone else, right? They're, they're just as allergic as your average American or Canadian. Even though and they're living this agricultural life that may, that's right. might think is protecting them. Right. So what's the major difference? Well, they keep their livestock far away. They do like this factory farming. They keep it far away from their homes, whereas the Amish have these little farms where their homes are like 20, 30 feet from the barn. Um, so if you think of the, the, the cow shed as this factory of, of microbes that are probiotic microbes that prevent allergy, they're missing all that in the Hutterite land. Um, and they also – the men are the only people who work with the animals. So what's interesting about the research from Europe is that they find that women who are pregnant who are working with animals have kids who are like the least allergic of all the women. It's like the earlier your exposure begins, the less allergic you'll end up. And they think it actually – the microbes stimulate the mother's immune system, and that stimulation goes – through the placenta, I mean, it, you know, via like cytokines, which are these immune signaling molecules, and starts training the infant immune system before they're even born. So you get the, so this happens in Amish country because pregnant women are out there milking the cows too, and the kids are out from an early age playing in the barn. They're getting this exposure, whereas in Hutterite country, the kids don't have any of that exposure, and the pregnant women don't have any of that exposure. Um, and they did this really interesting study of the different immune profiles, and they have a different sort of here are two populations that are, in theory, genetically very close because they come from the same part of German-speaking Switzerland um, and, and southern Germany, I think. And they have this very different-looking immune system. And they, they did these studies where they, you know, they tested it in mice, and sure enough, the mice who are exposed to Amish cow dust or Amish cow shed dust were less allergic than the mice that were exposed to Hutterite dust. So, I mean, like, so th- this research is getting closer and closer to an actionable probiotic. Right, based on let's just say an Amish cow shed probiotic, uh, where that we would use as an intervention early in life. I mean, it's getting closer. Right. We're you, still not there. Well, you just We're take your kid. 
when you're, or you could just, when you're pregnant, go milk some cows or when your kids I, early on have them play in the cow shed and let them I, absor- breathe a lot and absorb it. And we should I build our that, own cow sheds. Every house, every house should have a cow shed. That, that is, is going to be, it's going to be more complicated because it has to be chronic exposure. So okay. taking your kid to a cow shed for a week. Not enough. Is not gonna help. But, but while you're in the cow shed, you want to eat a peanut butter sandwich with your kid because that's another example where people are saying this peanut allergy thing is because people are eating their peanut butter so late in life they don't have a chance, right? Same argument, well, right? Well, yeah, in a way, except for we're talking about the exposing yourself to the allergen versus uh, training your immune system. Yeah, okay. Different uh, mechanisms. You know, Fair enough. Different, yeah, yeah. different mechanisms. But you can do the peanut butter sandwich thing regardless of whether or not you're in a cow shed, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, just no. To, no, I just, just want to, to kill two birds with one, <laughs> I don't know, peanut butter sandwich. I don't know, yeah, one, trip, yeah. one trip to Pennsylvania. Um, let's close with, with uh, something you, you discuss in the – and we'll put a link up to your Amish article, which is – Really interesting, although it, it is a small sample, as as you point out, and as some people have pointed out, it may not be as reliable as we'd hope. But it is very interesting. The but it, so so the Amish are a small sample, but the other stuff from Switzerland, those are thousands of kids at this point, hundreds at least, thousands probably of kids. They've done over and over and over in Europe, not just in Switzerland, but also in Denmark and in parts of Germany. I mean, like everywhere. This is very solid finding over there. That exposure to agriculture reduces allergies, a correlation to cow, to cow sheds in particular okay. and to milk. I mean, it's very it's a strong finding. Cool. Um, let's close with a, a, a another world that you wrote about. You called it uh, an underworld of people who are treating themselves for conditions which include multiple sclerosis, um, I don't know what else it's including, but these are serious, debilitating problems that people are getting on the web, exploring the realities of other people who have explored this and medicating themselves with parasites. And we talked a little bit about this the first time we talked, but just just tell us where where that world is. I'm sure it's blossomed rather dramatically. And of course, the, the organized medical world, not so always happy with it. Some people view it as understandable and, and accept it, but others are hostile to it because it's, you know, it's, quote, unsupervised. But there's something beautiful and poignant about people connecting with people around the world and, and learning about these techniques and getting access to this stuff that couldn't have been imagined 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, except for in the article, I make the... Uh, We're not sure it works, but other than that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with No, but with, with the, uh, the that movie, the uh, Dallas Buyers Club, right. they were doing the same thing at the yep. beginning of the, the AIDS epidemic. You know, yep. they were trying to self-treat because... Because there was no one was helping. Because mainstream medicine yeah. totally was just ignoring them because it, they considered them all to be either gay or or just degenerates in general and was not helping them in any way. So they took the matters in their own hands. Um, so regarding, I should back up and say that when we last spoke, I think that there was a trial underway to test one of the organisms that had the only organism that's really been scientifically or that is in any that has any rigor behind it any scientific rigor and that was the pig whipworm which is developed by Joel Weinstock and those tests failed mm. they did it did not uh, work now there are like you go into this community you even talk to some of the scientists there are lots of reasons they might have failed that don't have to do with the fact that the organism doesn't work, but also it could be that the organism just doesn't work and this whole idea. And then what we saw that seemed to work was just a placebo effect, that people were so desperate that their psychological state is what drove the result, not the worm. Well, no, they had a placebo group in those studies, but those were small studies. I yeah. mean, this is why we need big studies. Yeah. Um, and I think one of them was not blinded also. So this, the, the, at least the... The investigators knew who was getting the treatment and who was getting the placebo. Yeah. Um, but they also – like if you talk to some of the people who are in this world, the, the, the company was making these these uh, these parasites for human consumption. They changed the formula right before they did these large trials, which is kind of like – why would Oops. you do that? Yeah. So, I mean, you know – I don't know. I think the most likely answer is probably the most – you know, Occam's razor, right? The yeah. most likely answer is probably that it doesn't work, but – there are, I think, legitimate questions. But so that did not work. Um, meanwhile, there's a guy in Australia who's doing interesting work with a different organism. He and his idea is that the the, the, whip, the pig whipworm was never going to work anyways because it's not adapted to humans. You need a human adapted organism. Um, 
Alex Lucas, he's been, he has some really kind of remarkable studies, longitudinal studies, very small, like curing celiac disease with, with uh, hookworms, or I should say sending it into remission. They're very small. He's doing larger ones now, I think. But so you have this kind of conflicting evidence coming from the actual scientific world. And this, in, in the absence of any um, certain answer from science, this community has blossomed and it's probably growing bigger even as we speak because there's so much desperation. And I got to say that the if you have one of these diseases like you know multiple sclerosis, you sort of just end up progressively more, less able to move and more and more paralyzed. And, and eventually if it's severe, you end up unable to breathe potentially. I mean, these are horrible diseases and we don't have lots of good treatments for them. We have some that are- Slow that, it down. They slow it down. I mean, for multiple sclerosis, there's a number, but like and a lot of the, uh, like for inflammatory bowel disease and a lot of the, um, for like rheumatoid arthritis, they use, they just block an aspect of your immune system um, with these TNF, you know, with Remicades or TNF blockers. That's just a pro-inflammatory protein in your immune system. So what you're doing is you're hobbling part of your immune system, which is good if it works to treat the disease, but it's bad in that it opens up. Everything else, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, like it's the fears are always overblown. You have to look at the actual numbers and the actual numbers are pretty minor. But I can tell you that when you talk to this community of people, the potential, the, the fact that you might get different kinds of cancers that are incurable or like infections that kill you because you're taking these immune suppressing drugs looms very large in their imagination. Right. Yeah. And so they say, well, what the hell? Why wouldn't I just go try a parasite? Like I can get rid of a parasite. It's not going to kill me. I can get yep. rid of it. Psychologically, in, in, it's not a pleasant thought, but it's um, – Well, wait wait a minute. Which is not the pleasant thought? That you might die from a – No, the, from, putting, the putting them the, – the direct decision to let – to push them into your body through your skin, through a patch or whatever, to put the eggs in. It's just something – it's not a pleasant thought. I'm it, sorry. There's, a, there's an ick factor, but <laughs> yeah, I mean – that's all. Just an ick factor, think, yeah. Think about the, all, the, the, yeah. the alternative, no, the alternative which horrible. again is – is overblown in people's imagination. The numbers are quite small of people who develop this, right? But the possibility that you might just die from taking a, 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 taking a medicine that, that to treat your disease, which is incurable, it's just – it's untenable to many people. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, or many of them have tried it and it didn't work. You know, those drugs don't work for everyone. So um, and that's the other part of this, right, is that so much of this is – Almost certainly person specific, right? So it oh, might work for this yeah. person, but it might work for that person, both the drug or the worms. Yeah. yeah. Or, and that's what I think. I mean, what I suspect, like there's no real good evidence that, that taking worms can treat anything. What I suspect, though, is that it works for some subset of people. I mean, there, you know, so there, of course, what happens online is you, you get these from spectacular, yeah. spectacular stories, and the failure is you don't, it's like harder to find the failing stories. They're there, you have to seek them out. But there is no sort of like even handedness in dealing with these two types of stories, right? Yeah. Um, so you get these these glorious results. You you read about them. You say, "Crap, I'm going to try that," and you try it. And um, and for some people, it works. For many people, it doesn't. I wonder about the people who feel worse in some ways. But then again, if your if what your baseline is is multiple sclerosis or like the horrible pain of of Crohn's disease. Um, the symptoms of a parasite infection might be a great improvement a if that's all you're dealing with, sure. right? Yeah. Um, so that's what's happening. And, and where it is is I, I wish scientists would actually do case studies on these people because I think it works for some of them. Uh, and it would be great if we knew, if we understood more how it's working. Well, I look forward to having you back on in five years, if not sooner, <laughs> if not sooner, to talk about – I mean both these stories, again, I see them as linked. Uh, they're both a very similar – to me, they're, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. They're really complicated. They're out of sight, and um, they're, they're awfully interesting to me, and you write about them in really interesting ways. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'll be glad to come back. My guest today has been Moises Velasquez Manoff. Thanks for being part of Econ Talk, Moises. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.